Right, hello and welcome to this week's non this week's this month's non farm payrolls webinar. September non farm pay it is September, isn't it? Yeah, Key, I can't even know I don't yes. even know what month it is. <laughs> September, that's the drugs. Um, the, it's all the uh, paracetamol and lemsips that I'm taking. Um, this this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague Colin Szynski in Toronto. Um, we're basically just doing the disclaimers at the moment and the risk warnings. Um, so please take some time to digest them for all the various jurisdictions, and uh, then we can pretty much get started. So, this month's payrolls report, widely anticipated. I'm not sure really that it's as relevant as it was, say, three or four months ago. I mean, when you look at the pace of US jobs growth over the course of the last few months, we can see from this, um, this spreadsheet here, this is the non-farm payrolls numbers from last month, 215, 231, 260, 187. You know, we had a bit of a blip in March, 119, but generally we were averaging around about 200,000 jobs um, for most, for the most part of this year. So um, I certainly think even a, a disappointing number is probably not going to ad adversely affect. What is noticeable, though, is the weakness in the ADP numbers, um, which we've seen quite... Um, you know, quite recently, the, there's only been one number above 200,000 200, um, in pretty much the last six months, um, which suggests to me that maybe um, the U.S. jobs market is maybe not as strong as people think that it is, certainly if the ADP numbers are anything to go by. So it's going to be an interesting number. Um, certainly going to have a look at uh, the, the key markets and the key support and resistance levels for that number, but certainly I think in, in the context of expectations of a Fed rate hike, they're a lot lower now than they were this time a month ago. The unemployment rate, we're expecting a number in the region of around about 5.2%, which is down ever so slightly, but you have to take that with a little bit of a pinch of salt because it has to be judged in conjunction with the U.S. participation rate which is currently at a 36-year low. So, um, again, the importance of that number is, uh, needs to be put in the conjunction with the participation rate. With, for me, I think it's the lack of inflation that's really the key driver, and obviously the events in China. And if we can do a quick recap of that, obviously what set off the, the downward spiral in stock markets was on August the 11th when China moved its trading band um, against the dollar ever so slightly um, to basically, I think, weaken its currency because of the damage it had done, the strength it had done to its export capability. And we've got Chinese trade numbers next week. So China's going to be a factor in any Fed delibera deliberations. I don't think it should be, but I think that it will be. And obviously the lack of inflation. So I know, Colin, you're expecting a good number. So yes, why don't I talk about my menu and we'll, uh, we'll talk about our expectations. Absolutely. So you, off you go, mate, and I'll take okay. a water. So in my uh, morning commentary today, which is up on the uh, Insights, I've put a menu for, uh, for how the street will probably take uh, different levels of employment reports based on, on when the, uh, the Fed might start raising interest rates. So a strong report, which would be above 250,000, I think would may, would, a lot of people would be thinking of September pretty clearly. If we get 200 to 250, which is the sweet spot of the last few uh, years, then we'd probably be looking September or October. I think if we come in below 200, or as Michael noted has been kind of the average and tipping point down to about 150. People would probably say, well, maybe we go a little later in the year, say October or December. And then I think if you came in below 150, people would be looking more at December or possibly even a delay uh, into next year. Similarly, if we look at average hourly earnings on the inflation side, it, it's similar kind of numbers. Above 2.5% would pretty much nail down September. I don't think we're going to see that anyways. 2 to 2.5 would probably keep them on track to September, October. 1 to 1.5 one, one to 2, maybe a, minor, a small delay to, say, October, December, and below 1.5 would be a real signal of, of weakening inflation, probably push them off to next year. So we looked at the uh, – when I was looking at the ADP figures that came out 
on uh, Wednesday, they were pretty much flat to the uh, the month before, and there was a, a slight downward revision to the previous month. So uh, all in, when you accounted for the revision, there was an increase of about 13,000. So I took the uh, the Fed's uh, Sorry, the last month, uh, which was around 215, added about 13 and, and rounded it off. So I've come in with about 230. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that it might be a little bit uh, optimistic on that, but I think overall we're probably looking at a flat to uh, to slightly higher reading for non-farm payrolls. Michael, however, has a different opinion. I do. Yeah, I think we'll get 160 because generally August tends to be on the weaker side of expectations. And one of the reasons I think we'll probably get a weaker number, and I've been wrong before, so I'll probably be wrong again, is the weak ISM reports that we saw um, earlier um, earlier this week, particularly in the manufacturing sector. We saw declines in employment, and we saw declines also um, in uh, new orders, and we also saw declines in prices, but it was the employment component that I was particularly struck by and um, you know that that was particularly weak. I'm now going to shut the calendar because we've basically now got the alerts pop up. So we should see whether or not these change um, as and when when the, when the numbers come out. But certainly, I think when we're looking at the non-farm payrolls report, the numbers aren't as important as I say they were two or three months ago. But certainly, I think a weak number um, may may just I think cause some of the more hawkish members to maybe waver a little bit more than they have been. And I think it was notable, actually, that Dennis Lockhart, the Atlanta Fed president, who was saying, actually, in early August, that he felt that the barriers to not acting, or the bar to not acting to raise interest rates, was very high, how he changed his tune um, last week and said that maybe he was a little bit more... Um, concerned given the volatility that we've seen in not only currency markets but equity markets as a whole. So let's look at the key levels because I think the key levels, I think there's an awful lot of things that have happened that have shifted the dynamic somewhat with respect to equity markets and I'm certainly a lot more bearish now than I was a month ago and there's a number of reasons for that. We'll start with the Dow, shall we Colin, because I know that you want to talk about that so I'll bring that chart up. And we can, talk, we can talk about the, the death cross um, rollover and the fact that even though we have rebounded, we actually haven't thus far managed to rebound significantly. Look where the 200-week moving average is on that. We bounce right off it. But we haven't been able to sustain this rebound, even though we've got a very long shadow. But I'll let you talk a little bit more. Uh, yes, yeah, so about uh, at the beginning of August, there was a death cross on the Dow, which is a uh, when the 50-day moving average goes under the 200-day moving average. It's the opposite of the golden cross. And uh, a lot of through the first part of August, there was a lot of people wondering, well, is this a real signal? Does this mean the market's over? And then kaboom, the market, the bottom fell out from under the markets. Now we've had a bit of a rebound here, and and is, and we've had a failure at a lower high. We're into a bit of a symmetrical triangle here, which is usually a consolidation pattern, which suggests we could get another down leg. When I, I've been thinking about this and I've been thinking about uh, previous summer sell-offs like we had in 2011 and in particular, I've been looking at 98, which was also driven by an emerging markets crisis. In that case, it was Russia rather than China. But anyway, in those cases, you had a summer sell-off, you had a rebound to a lower high, and then you had a retest. So I'm still of a mind that we could get a retest in late September, early October. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, indeed. So we'll look so we're looking at that, and what is also quite interesting is how we've got almost got a little bit of what I would call a greystone doji on mm -hmm. the candle that we saw yesterday. We tried to go higher, but we pretty much gave up all those gains in the space by the time we by the time we got to the close. So I think you know there is concern about markets being overly long of stocks or overly overly bullish at this point in time, simply because of the fact that people are so undecided about certainly not only what the Fed is going to do, but what's going to happen with respect to China. And I think that more than anything here, again, this is borne out here, the key resistance, I think, for the S&P is going to be these series of highs just above 1985. So really, I think if we're, if we're going to reverse the slightly bearish sentiment that we've got at the moment, I think we need to go back above 2,000 in the S&P. 
I don't know what your view is on that, Colin, but certainly I think that's certainly what I would be looking at above Absolutely. This, this series of peaks here, which is around about 1995, 1998. If you actually look at, you can probably draw a, a trend line probably through um, these series of lows that we made um, there, actually. That's probably looking potentially as if we could have broken through them. But always be a little bit suspicious of, of that. Let's redraw that line again from the low. We're right on it. We're yeah. right on it. So that that could be interesting. So keep an eye on that low there. Um, that is, we just quickly look at that. That's 1902. So the 1900 level, keep an eye on that in the event of a disappointing number or even a good number. But, it, you know, it's hard to say. This looks like a triangular consolidation here, actually, when I look at it on the four-hour chart. Draw a line through there and a line through there. That could be quite interesting. So keep an eye on those two converging trend lines. They could give us some some significant moves. But certainly, I think in the context of this oscillator here, the momentum does appear to, to be towards the downside. We've got a bearish engulfing here, which would appear to suggest that potentially we, we may get a move to back towards the lows that we saw um, uh, at the, uh, in the middle of last week. So let's move away from that. Also, on the pro in the process of posting a death cross on the DAX, and again, that's potentially fairly negative. And again, I take you back to what I've said about Dow theory in the past. Um, the averages need to confirm each other. You need confirmation of signals. And if you're getting death crosses posted on the Dow, the S&P, and now you're getting them on the DAX as well, that suggests to me that sentiment is starting to turn slightly bearish towards stocks. That's not to say we can't go higher, but certainly in the context of the price action that we've seen, it's remarkable how similar all the various price moves have been in the context of the move off the lows. So, you know, I think it's significantly important. If we get a poor payrolls number, then I think you can get, you'll, I think you'll find the dollar gets sold off. Right, we're coming up to three minutes. You want to do yep. dollar CAD, Colin, so let's yes. do that. And I'll do, I'll talk briefly about Canada, John. So in Canada, what we've been running into was, of course, we had the GDP report recently. Canada's gone into a technical recession overall of two negative, uh, two negative GDP quarters in a row. Uh, the issue there is that the oil price uh, crash has had a major negative impact on the energy sector and the Alberta economy. However, the, uh, the rest of the economy and other regions are doing reasonably well and are actually benefiting from the lower Canadian dollar. So we're, in a, uh, we're still in a, uh, in a pattern here where people are wondering, well, how bad is this going to be? Uh, and we, the, uh, the, front, the negative impact of the oil going down was all front-ended. The benefits come later, and we're starting to see that. And uh, interesting I was much more bearish on the uh, Canadian employment till I saw the export numbers come out the, uh, yesterday, which were actually quite positive and showed some improvement and suggested that the lower loony is starting to work in, and the uh, stats can even said that it was from non-energy exports. So that is, so things are, we are working through this transition in Canada. Based on that, Street is looking for a 5,000 decline this month. Uh, last month was up 6K full-time, was down about 15,000, 17,000. I'm looking for a bit of a rebound in full-time and a flat over month figure for uh, Canada jobs. The uh, looking at uh, dollar CAD here, we are in a rising channel. We've been leveling off here in and around the uh, the 121. 42, 133.20 range. 133.20, 133.30 on dollar CAD is very significant because it's 75 cents on CAD US dollar when we flip it over and look at it the other way. So that's a big round number test there. If we, uh, if we break through it, then we could be looking at another up leg. If we don't, we'd be looking at a, at a pullback. Interestingly, here on the stochastics, we are getting a negative divergence. We got higher high in the uh, dollar CAD, lower high in stochastics suggests we are seeing the upward momentum slowing. We have had a rebound recently in the crude oil price, and interestingly, I don't think CAD has gone back up as much as, uh, as WTI has, so it tells me, it says to me that people probably don't believe the uh, the rally when you went up 28% in three days. I'm not surprised. So we'll, uh, we'll watch some of the oil currencies and how they act as well relative to the oil price over the next couple of weeks to see what, if people are thinking that WTI moves sustainable or not. And let's go over and look at the yen. We've got a couple more minutes, about a minute. Yeah, you know, this is five minutes dollar yen, and it, is, it does, does appear to be tracking a little bit higher. And usually, you get a front-running move on dollar yen. So certainly worth keeping an eye on um, the lows that we've seen so far this 
today, but we, th we were in a nice little upward channel on the five minute chart here, so certainly worth keeping an eye on this little bit of a trend line here, see whether or not you know, we, we continue this move. But overall, I think a poor number, the dollar will go down. Big levels for me on Euro dollar are yesterday's lows, and they also happen to be the two moving averages around about 50 and 100 days, so 110.80, 110.90, big, big level on Euro dollar. If we stay above that, then I think Euro's got potential to squeeze higher, and a similar sort of thing with respect to the pound against the dollar as well. I think there's probably potentially we could move down to 150.170, but overall, I think we're well overdue a rebound. Okay, so we've got 20, we've got, excuse me, we've got 20 odd seconds to go. My voice is starting to give out again. Sorry about that. And um, the the, the dollar yen is now starting to track lower. So obviously, people are starting to get a little bit twitchy. And the numbers will be out in five seconds, and I will be quiet, and we can digest them. 173. Oh, I was close, wasn't I? You were very close, Michael. Well done. Um, average earnings the previous slightly... revised up to 245K. Wow. But look at the average earnings numbers. They were also up to 0 0.3. The unemployment rates dropped to 5.1. So, again, you've got bad news and good news in that. Let's look at the participation rate. The participation rate is still at 62.6. .6. So the unemployment rate is lower. The payrolls is disappointing, which is why you've had the snap back in dollar yen because the unemployment rate is slightly better, and obviously average earnings are slightly better than forecast. And the the annualised rate for that is 2.2%. So that's been adjusted up. So the headline rate disappointing, which has given us the knee-jerk reaction lower, but I think the dollar could go a little bit stronger on the back of those average earnings numbers. So, Wage inflation's holding up. Yeah, well, it's starting, it's, starting to, it's starting to regain a little bit of traction, and as a result, look at where we're going on dollar yen. Back up again. So really, I think there's a bit of, there's a bit of something for everyone in those jobs mm -hmm. numbers. Disappointment on the downside, but the revision higher was 245. That's positive. Um, inflation starting to filter through into average earnings, but let's not forget that unit labour costs for Q2 were negative to 1.5% earlier this week. So we're still getting very mixed messages, I think, from um, the US economy with respect to what wages are doing. Because on the one hand, you're getting negative numbers, and on the other hand, you're getting positive numbers. But overall, I don't think this, this particular number has done anything to really change the debate about whether or not we get a September rate rise. Agree or disagree? Discuss. Uh, I agree. I don't think I think the Fed is still on track towards a September October rate rise with these numbers because if you take the 30k upward revision to last month, add it to the 170, puts you at 200, which is great, pretty much right on the average. Uh, I just wanted to talk a second about the Canada numbers. Headline number is 12k increase up from a 5k de uh, forecast. Street was looking 5k decrease. The best part of all: 55,000 increase in full-time employment, 42,000 decrease in part-time. Obviously. We're always looking at, uh, at full-time employment as being better for the economy. That's a huge increase. Suggests that the, uh, the, lower, the benefits of the lower loony are starting to work their way into the economy. So that should be good for the uh, Canadian dollar. And look at uh, U.S. dollar CAD dropping on that. Like, wow, that's, it's a big number for, uh, for Canada. So that's a, uh, a huge improvement. We're seeing that show up in dollar CAD today. So certainly I think key level on dollar CAD remains these two lows here at the beginning of September and the end of October. Absolutely. October around about 130, 1.20. What could drive um what could drive the Canada even higher? Maybe a rebound in the oil price. Um so certainly mm -hmm. keep an eye on Euro dollar around about one ten eighty, ladies and gentlemen. I think that could be a key level. One fifty one seventy on cable, as as I, I as I mentioned in, in our summary just before the numbers. But also I think in the context of um WTI prices or crude oil prices, keep an eye on the crude prices as well because at the moment they're they're, they're showing to slightly positive, which is good for Canada. You want to rebound in crude oil prices. And I did a video earlier this week where I suggested 
that we may have bottomed out in crude oil prices, and I'll explain some of the reasoning behind that. I mean, everyone knows the, the supply and demand story. It's probably been done to death. Everyone thinks that oil prices are going to go lower. But if we look at the last few weeks' performance, we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten down weeks in succession without a single rally until last week where we got a key reversal day or a key reversal week or a or a bullish engulfing week. I suggest it was huge. That was a massive turnaround for yeah. uh, crude oil. And 25% in three days off the lows suggests to me that mark, you know, the market is very, very short. It's very, very one way in its expectations for low oil price. And that suggests to me that um, we could well see maybe a move back to $49, $50 a barrel. That's going to be the key resistance level for me. It's also 50% retracement of the down move from the May highs to the lows that we saw in August. So, you know, from, from, from my perspective, um, we've, we've certainly got potential to go higher simply because everyone else is calling it lower. And I always like to sit in the other camp from everybody else, particularly if it feels the right thing to do. And in this case, it does. Everyone is so bearish oil that the market, the trade seems a little bit crowded. This is WTI. It's a similar sort of story on Brent as well. The markets, the markets correlate each other quite nicely. So... Can I add something there, Michael? You can. Something else I've noticed over the course of this week, when after the three-day run-up, you, you figured you'd have a correction, and that's not unusual. But the correction has been fairly small relative to the rally. And on top of that, the other thing I've seen a couple of days this week is crude oil start off the day soft and then gain strength as the day has gone on. We've seen that a couple of times this week as well, which is also suggesting some uh, renewed, uh, renewed bullish interest. The bulls are starting to come in, taking what the bears can throw at them and overcoming it. No, it's certainly, it's certainly a consideration. And again, this is this is the Brent price. This is, I think, found it slightly more difficult to sustain higher levels, mm -hmm. judging by the length of this shadow on this week's candle. But overall, it doesn't negate what's happened here. You know, we basically made a new low. We closed not only on the highs of the week, but we've closed above the previous week's close and the week before that as well. And you can't, under, you can't underestimate what a significant rebound that is in the context of the down move that we've seen. So um, for those oil bears out there, be careful, because I think there are some early warning signs that potentially we could well have seen the short-term base, and we could actually potentially trade a little bit higher. I don't think we're going to go back to the levels that we saw in the middle of last year, but we certainly could well revisit the highs that we've seen in April and May. Uh, and Absolutely, and I mean a 40 to 60 move in both directions is pretty big and great for trading. Absolutely, if you're the right side of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, I've just been asked a question, how much is China a factor in U.S. growth and what does this mean for U.S. stocks? In terms of ch China, in terms of um, U.S. stocks is probably not that much of a factor. What's more of a factor, I think, is the strong dollar. And mm. the, fact, the fact of the matter is, if, if we look at the dollar and how much it's appreciated, and we, we can sort of get a gauge of that from this chart here, and, we can, and it also explains why Chinese policymakers um, did what they did with respect to um, with respect to um, uh, easing, easing their peg, because the Chinese currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. Now, since 2014, we've seen the dollar rise, and we can actually see that borne out in Euro, Euro Chinese renminbi, which was really, I think, what startled me was actually how startling it was in the context of how closely correlated Euro dollar and Euro renminbi are. And um, once the chart loads, you'll, you'll be able to see what I mean. So here we have the, the Euro Chinese renminbi, and, well, the blue li and the blue line is Euro dollar. So we, let me remind you about those Chinese trade numbers in August. There was a 12% drop in Chinese exports to Europe, and there was a 12% drop in Chinese exports to Japan. This here 
is a 20% appreciation of the Chinese currency against the euro since the ECB embarked on quantitative easing in March last year. That's when euro dollar was around about 140. So we can see that at the early part of this year, the Chinese currency was 20% stronger. The euro was 20% weaker. So it's any wonder that the Chinese were a little bit concerned about the strength of their currency relative to the euro and decided to loosen their peg against the dollar. So when you hear people like Donald Trump or Jacob Liu, the US Treasury Secretary, criticizing China for currency manipulation, just remember what the Fed's done in the last six years and, um, you know, stop throwing stones, basically. The Chinese are novices at this. The Fed are professionals mm -hmm. and the biggest currency manipulator in the world are the Americans. It's the U.S. and um, and the On ECB. Top of that, Michael, I Sorry? loved when uh, I loved back in the in the previous decade during the Bush years that the U.S. had a strong dollar policy while they were running a massive devaluation of their own. Hmm. And yeah, they kept and, going, "Oh, we yeah. have a strong dollar policy." Yeah, right, you do. <laughs> anyway, it's funny, sorry, I digress. Time. So, so what yeah. we've got here, this, this Euro-Chinese renminbi chart, what we've seen here is a breakout higher yes, from indeed. the Euro against the renminbi. Now, that suggests to me that if you actually look at this chart and project it higher, then the likelihood is we're going to get further Chinese currency depreciation against the Euro. That can happen one of two ways. It can either happen by Euro-dollar going up or the dollar Chinese renminbi going up. Now, I don't expect the Chinese renminbi to, to depreciate against the dollar to the amount of, that it needs to to get this figure here back up to round about here. So euro dollar needs to take up, take up some of the slack. And that, to my mind, should put a floor under euro dollar. Um, similar sort of story if you do the same thing with the Chinese renminbi against the yen. So in the context of your original question, sir, I don't think China's that much of a factor in U.S. growth, but I certainly think it's a factor in terms of um, a policy response, a Chinese central bank policy response to their strong currency. Because what will happen is if they continue to ease monetary policy and essentially weaken the yuan, they will be exporting deflation around the world. And if they do that, it'll make it very, very difficult um, for the Fed to not only raise rates, but to try and weaken, keep the dollar weak. The strength of the dollar will actually weigh on U.S. growth, less than probably the Chinese story. But the Chinese will have a pull factor involved. Now, this is the dollar-yen, similar sort of story. Um, the Chinese currency against the yen, you can see how much it's appreciated, pretty much in line with dollar yen. What we haven't seen yet, we've seen a massive fall in the renminbi against the yen, but dollar yen it hasn't actually played catch up. Now, again, that suggests to me that potentially we could well see further dollar yen losses going forward as dollar yen is currently lagging behind the Chinese currency against the yen. So it's, it's certainly an interesting it's certainly an interesting conversation. And actually, can I add maybe oh. you sure can. Thanks. I just wanted to mention one other way that you see this come back around for the U.S. is, is not necessarily through the uh, through the value of the U.S. dollar or, through, or sorry, yeah, you can have it through the U.S. dollar, but not necessarily on GDP. But where it comes through is in corporate earnings. When you get the higher U.S. dollar, China's going off the rails, and a lot and it's dragging a lot of other currencies down with it. And we get in a, a, a rally in the U.S. dollar on this and safe haven capital flows. You drive up the U.S. dollar, that hurts U.S. corporate earnings and that's where you really see it show up because it's twofold. It, it hurts U.S. exports and it also means that U.S. companies with their overseas earnings when they get translated back to U.S. dollars get translated back at a lower level. We saw that when the, when the oil price crashed and the U.S. dollar took off at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, it took a quarter or two and then and they said, okay, this is going to show up, this is going to show up. Well, in the second quarter and the first quarter numbers, it really started to show up where all of a sudden all the U.S. companies started missing on earnings, particularly in the tech sector, who are big exporters. Right. I've just been asked another question, Colin. Um, mm -hmm. If the U.S. economy is 70% the consumer, which it is, should we not see the U.S. grow stronger on a stronger dollar, giving consumers purchasing power? Yes, you should. So let's look at the numbers, shall we? Because I've done a spreadsheet of that and the consumer confidence numbers, because this is retail sales. 
and durable goods, core durable goods. So that's with transportation stripped out. So yeah, you're absolutely right because you've got more purchasing power because of lower oil prices, lower gasoline prices. Surely the U.S. consumer should be going out and spending more. And certainly if you look at the consumer confidence numbers, 100.9, 93.4, 101.4, the U.S. consumer does appear to be confident. However, it's not really being bought out in the spending patterns. Let's look at retail sales growth over the last few months. We've got minus 0.8 in January, minus 0.5 in February, plus 1.5, 0, 1.2, 0, 0.6. Let's look at durable goods. Again, these are big ticket items, TVs, washing machines, that sort of thing. 0.61. So basically July and June, fairly good. But before that, minus 0.3, minus 0.6, 0.6, minus 1.7. So yes, to your first question, but U.S. consumers, apart from the fact they appear to be doing quite an awful lot of auto sales and auto sales at record levels, they're not really spending money anywhere else. You know, and that sort of got me scratching my head a little bit with respect to consumers' purchasing power. They've got all this extra purchasing power, but they're not using it because it's not being reflected in retail sales and it's not being reflected in durable goods. So why aren't they spending it? You look at personal income data and you look at personal spending, and they're pretty much in lockstep with each other. What's holding U.S. consumers back? Are they paying down debt? Are they saving up for a rainy day? Or are they just particularly concerned about inflation? It's hard to say. You certainly look at mortgage rates. Mortgage rates are fairly high relative to where they were, say, two or three years ago. Maybe they're worried about increased housing costs. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's any number of reasons why you could argue that the U.S. economy or the U.S. consumer is not spending money. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question, and I don't think Colin does either. Or do you? No, I haven't figured it out. Well, the only thing, interesting thing was that when the oil price crashed, where you figured there'd be a big jump in consumer spending, and, the there, only wasn't. Have, and there wasn't, and the problem is that uh, one of the problems is that the gasoline price never went down. The gasoline price has gone down nowhere near what the um, what we would have expected. And it's held up, and refining margins have gone through the roof. So we're seeing the integrated oils and, and refiners posting massive profits. And, uh, and, and finally, that's probably that's coming at the expense of consumer spending, in my opinion. Okay, so let's have a look at gasoline prices, Colin, shall we? Because I've got sure. them here somewhere. I think they're yeah, – here we go, gasoline. Cash price of gasoline. Let's have a look at that. So basically, this is where gasoline prices were in June last year. Three dollars. Let's overlay up WTI on top of that. Okay, so let's go and let's do that then. Okay, so I'll take the WTI contract there and then just drop that straight in there. And let's go and normalise that. Go and change that chart type to a mid chart. So the purple line ladies and gents, is the crude oil price chart. And, you know, Colin is right. We saw a bit of a rebound in 2015 um, with respect to the gasoline price, much more than the crude price. But we're still, you know, 40% down on gasoline prices from where we were in, in November 2013. Let me just change that so that it's actually from the beginning of or the end of 2013. So let's do that. So we've got a better indication there. So they're not that far apart, mate, to be fair. Yeah, they've narrowed in the last couple of months or so as the, as the summer has gone on. But I think in particular you saw a really wide narrow there February, March, the April, May, yeah, June. And that's yeah, it's narrowed in the last month or so. And that's probably why you've seen retail sales pick up in the past yeah. couple of months because that gap has started to narrow. Um, yeah, and I expect it will continue now that we're getting to the end of driving season So do you as of this that, weekend. Do you think that was just profiteering on the back of the gasoline providers as driving season got underway? They pushed gasoline prices up. Most so, people think so. We always we always joke around here about how when the oil price goes up, gasoline goes up right away, and when the, the oil price goes down, oh, it takes six weeks or two months to work its way through this. <laughs> There's all kinds of commentary over here about gas prices and conspiracies and, and so on. So I mean, I mean, these kind of things wouldn't surprise me, right? I mean, but you, you do get a natural spike in demand uh, in the summertime, and, and gasoline trading historically moves ahead of that. So the, the pattern we've seen 
in, in gasoline related to seasonality is not unusual. I think what's unusual is the, is the big big spread you've seen with with it relative to crude prices this year. Mm. Okay, so um, unless anyone has any other questions, um, probably going to wrap wrap this up. We will obviously post it on YouTube once we're done. Um, but um, Colin and I would both like to thank you for your questions, for your um, uh, and, and for your attendance, and uh, hope you can join us same time next month. And also, actually, Colin and I are also doing a preview for the FOMC meeting on Thursday. I think it's is it the 17th? September 17th. September 17th, 3 p.m. Yeah. UK time. Colin and, and I are previewing, time. Pre previewing the FOMC on a, as, a, as a webinar, which you can sign up for on our website in the education section. So if you want to join us for that, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, both Colin and I would like to thank you for your attendance today and um, hope you make loads of money this afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day trading.